Let's begin this evening uh, looking at the question that I was just finishing up last week. What is Daniel 9 talking about? And it's talking about the most amazing prophetic chapter in the whole Bible. And, and the only thing I want to remind you of before we dig into Ezekiel is this, that God wants us to know about the future. Think about it, that it, it's not Hal Lindsey that thought all this up. It, it's not John Walvert of Dallas Seminary that thought all this up. It's not even J.N. Darby of the Plymouth Brethren that thought all this up. God is the one who in the book of Isaiah said, test me to know that I am the Lord. Do you know the things that are going to happen in the future? Because only I do, saith the Lord. And so what, what we see is prophecy was built by God for the purpose of helping us know the future. And so it, it's not like it's the fringe of Christendom that's into this. God is into it. And he's devoted, as we saw last week, a fourth of his book into uh, things to come. And so real quickly, what we saw in, in Daniel 9, the most amazing prophetic chapter in the Bible is this. There's so many pieces. Um, those four verses, 24, 25, and 26, and 27, basically tell us the scope of history, then specifically the 483 years, the church age, we would call it, it's just a, an interval, and then the last seven years. Uh, the scope is, God says he's determined that there are 490 years of history that revolve around the Jewish people. Remember, in God's map, Jerusalem's in the center, his people his chosen people of promise. Uh, and it surrounds the Jews in Jerusalem. It lasts 483 years. You say, how do you get 483 years? Well, it says, uh, there shall be uh, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Um, seven plus 62 makes 69 weeks. And if you look, uh, 69 times seven uh, weeks of years. And by the way, if you want to track this down, you'll find that this word that's used here is used in other parts of the Old Testament for kind of like we would use dozens, and it uses sevens. But that's where we come with the 483 years. And uh, the third part is, notice the wording, after three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So we know that's the crucifixion. Um, the crucifixion takes place after this time period. But this time period, if you, if you look here, there are 69 weeks that are talked about that are from the, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until actually God's counter ended on Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a bigger deal. It, you know, I mean, it's the... the triumphal entry of Christ. You know, some people wonder if it's really on Sunday, but it doesn't matter. What we call Palm Sunday is very big in God's calendar. It's the end of this period of his plans for Israel. And it ended when they, as it were, rejected Jesus as their king. They, they rejected him. And so following that, the time clock stopped, but Christ was crucified and Jerusalem was destroyed. And there's an indeterminate amount of time. It's, it's called an interval. It's just, God says, 69 weeks, one week. And that's what makes 70. But between the end of the 69th right here and the beginning of the final one, the 70th, is an indeterminate amount of time. And you say, well, what's it for? It's what the Bible calls till the fullness of the Gentiles shall come in. And I love it that some Bible teachers say that, that God has this, this clock, uh, this counting clock, and it's counting up time and people that are coming, and when the last one that he desires to enter into the church of Christ enters, boom. I mean, you're going to be out. In fact, uh, if you want to, it says hastening the day of the Lord. You want to hasten the day of the Lord, lead people to the Lord. Because you hasten when the last one that he has chosen for this time period to be saved is saved, boom. Then he takes his church out and it starts that 70th week. So we already covered this last week. The last seven years uh, is, is in Daniel 9, 27. And he, that's the prince that shall come, shall enforce the covenant with the many for one week. And see this, this whole uh, Daniel 9 thing is built around these 
heptads, these weeks of years, seven years. And so he's going to enforce a covenant for seven years. And in the middle of the seven years, the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and determination will be poured out in the desolate. I mean, all that is saying is everything that it chronicles. When you look at Revelation 13, and you, you see this antichrist coming and this image he sets up of himself and the, the uh, breaking of the covenant and, and tricking the Jewish people who were trusting in the false Messiah. And I'm looking forward in a, in a couple of weeks when we get on Sunday morning to the first seal of Revelation 6. The first seal is a white horse. The first event that the Lord unfolds for us is the rise of this man that is the ultimate superman in every way, super intellect, super communicator, super, uh, you know, mesmerizer of audiences. I mean, Hitler could keep the Munich stadium absolutely mesmerized with his orations and his everything he did. This fellow will be able to mesmerize, not just you know, Munich or, or uh, Germany, he will mesmerize the world and, and will give everybody what they always wanted uh, for a while. Uh, so that led us to the second question, where does this term seven year tribulation come from? It's right there. It's this idea that, that God had 483 years, whoop, 483 years or uh, 69 heptads that ended and there's this interval but the last section the last week the 70th week is seven years long and this this 70th week period is called uh the the tribulation or the as it says in chapter six on uh, at the end of six the great tribulation uh now this is something that we're going to cover tonight there is a prophesied two-chapter event in Ezekiel that, that describes the Magog invasion of Israel. The, you notice this and this and this? It's not clear in the Bible when it takes place. And so what we're going to do tonight is just, you know, it, it's understand what's going to happen, understand the, the participants but we don't know if it, if it falls right here before the tribulation. It could actually happen. It, it isn't clear whether it happens, uh, you know, sometime in, in you know, like, like near the time of Armageddon, any time during the week, before the week. Uh, it's just not clear, and I'll show you why. But what we do know is, that there's a rebuilt temple in this time period because in the center at the three and a half year mark, right here, right in the center of the tribulation, the Antichrist uh, defiles, sets up the image of himself and, and uh, breaks the covenant and all the things we read about in Revelation. So this is where the seven year tribulation comes from. It's that 70th week that is, that is culminated by the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Christ. And that launches into the personal direct rule of Christ called the millennium. Okay, now what's interesting, go to Daniel 10. I want to show you something because uh, I wanted to throw this in because someone mentioned it. it probably uh, they were reading Peretti books or something, you know, I don't know. But look in Daniel 10 because where did this idea of spiritual warfare on a global scale come from? And, and sometimes we... we uh, in our reading this, we don't really notice some of the things that, that it's talking about. Uh, first of all, in Daniel 10, if you read the whole chapter, you see that, that Daniel is fasting for three weeks. Now that immediately, um, when Jesus' disciples confronted a very powerful demon situation, Jesus said to them, this kind cometh not, but by what? Yeah. This kind cometh not, but by, remember God always puts this word first, and fasting. Uh, prayer in God's book is always first. But we will give ourselves to prayer in the ministry of the word. This kind cometh not, but by prayer and by fasting. 
And so prayer is, is a reference to our seeking God. Fasting is us denying ourself, our flesh. Uh, you know, the, the idea of um, that, that I am so weak, I need to seek God's strength. And I am, my flesh is so strong, I need to deny it. So first I start seeking the Lord, and then I start, you know, denying uh, the, the, the enemy within, the traitor, my flesh. So Daniel is, is already seeking the Lord, and he goes into this three-week fast, and the Lord dispatches a messenger to him, but for the whole fasting period, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, you know what's so interesting? Movie makers read the Bible. I mean, that was a movie a while back, The Prince of Persia. And I thought, do they know what they're talking about? Because there is a demon that is, that is behind this moment, what the Persians are doing in their hatred of Israel. And it is so interesting to think about the dark side, what we, you know, we don't even realize so much of, of, of it's not just uh, nation states buying, uh, you know, hypersonic missiles and, and Israel intercepting them and blowing them up last week. There's so much more going on, on the spiritual realm. That God, interestingly enough, in this chapter is one of the only places in the Bible, I mean, other than Job 1 and 2 that we've already looked at, pulls back for a moment the curtain because he wants us to know that there is so much going on that this is why the Bible says God is watching over his word to perform it because Satan doesn't understand the Bible and doesn't know what God is doing, but he's going to try and stop it at every hand. And so there is this this higher level of warfare. And so this prince of the kingdom of Persia, this, this order of demon creatures, remember Paul describes seven orders of demons, prince valleys and powers, and you know, he goes through all these you know, spiritual weakness in high places when he's talking about it. And if you add them up with the ones that are in the Old Testament, it appears that there are seven orders of demons that reflect the seven orders, you know, cherubim and seraphim and the archangel, Lucifer that was the anointed cherub. I mean, you know four right off, top, plus normal angels. So, um, but, but uh, until Michael, and Michael is the one that seems to always be the defender of God's chosen people who promised the Jews. So Michael comes in and, and uh, this messenger going to, that's on his way to Daniel, is hindered by this, this being. So Michael uh, comes and assists this angel to get to Daniel. And after giving Daniel, after that messenger gets to Daniel, this angel, and gives him chapter 11 and 12, he will have to deal with, and here's another one, appears to be one of these hierarchy of demons that is, that is influencing the nation of Greece. So all, all that to say, in a little while when we're looking at the maps, uh, we think of armies and soldiers and political leaders, and God sees overlaid over all that. Satan is just like in Job. Satan incited the Sabaeans to go and attack Job's flocks. Satan incited, and, and if you read, Satan can actually incite people groups to, to terrorize and kill and fight and war. He can drive them just like the demon of Gadara, the de demonized man. So this is very interesting, but I, I just wanted to see where that comes from. Now, let's go to Ezekiel 36. And um, that's really where uh, we were headed tonight and where we'll spend uh, uh, the next few minutes. But I want you to see one, one of the most amazing little stretches of the scripture. In fact, one of the more uh, hard to understand parts, especially Ezekiel 40 to 48, the temple and all that. But the question was, what is Ezekiel 36 through 39 describing? And, and actually what they wanted uh, was the chapter 38 and 39. But since 
they ask about 36, I thought we'd get a running start. And what they want to know is, who are the biblically described players in this event, and are Russia and Iran part of them? And I wanted to show you how, uh, how to meet the accusation. People accuse us as believers of, of uh, reading things into the Bible. So I wanted to show you how you arrive at the geographic and geopolitical players of Ezekiel 38 and 39. But, but uh, first of all, let's go to chapter 36. If, if I can go to 36. Connection lost. Oh, there. Connection unlost. Good. Uh, number one, it starts with God's promise to restore Israel as a nation. Look at Ezekiel 36, verses 22 uh, through 24. Now, this, this is God explaining his intentions. And this is what he says. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, verse 22, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. You see, Israel right now is an unwilling partner in this enterprise. God says, I am not protecting I'm not protecting Israel from the whole world against them for Israel's sake. I'm doing it for my sake. See, that's what's shaping up in our world. There is an entire group of people, 1.2 billion of them, who at the core of their belief system believe in the, the, the inferiority, the... the um, destruction of and the the resist in every way the jewish people and that's islam islam is focused from its core against israel and god said i am going to protect israel not for israel's sake they are by nature quite proud people they are by nature um you know sometimes mistreating people around them because they've been mistreated so much. God is not vouching for the righteousness of the nation of Israel. When God does Ezekiel 38 and 39, he's not doing it because they are the most uh, good Samaritan, you know, helpers of the poor in the world. He's doing it. I don't do this for your sake, so house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. You see, when God makes an eternal covenant. When he sovereignly elects, he doesn't unelect. And God sovereignly elected Israel. That's the, the literal lineage of Abraham, not the spiritual descendants of Abraham. That's us. We are not Israel. Israel is Israel, and God has a, a very clear plan for them, which you have profaned among the heathen whither you went. See, the, the Jews have profaned the name of God among the heathen. Uh, they are God's chosen people of promise, and they denied their king when he came, Jesus Christ himself. So, and I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall, and this is, one of the most repeated, in fact, it is the most repeated statement in the book of Ezekiel. Shall know that I am the Lord. Shall know that I am the Lord. Shall know the, that I am the Lord. The whole purpose of what God is doing with Israel is to show the world that he's the Lord. And really, if you want to know what the, the conflict is, if you remember uh, on Mount Carmel, um, it was, is Baal the Lord or uh, is it was a conflict between Baal or Jehovah, Yahweh. And uh, now, and, and you know, that's Elijah and the fire came down and all of that. And so Baal was proven to not be the Lord. Jehovah, Yahweh was. Well, today, the conflict that is coming to a head is, again, is it Allah and, and I don't take Allah to be a generic name for God. Allah is defined. There are 99 titles for Allah. And he has his 99 names. And many of them, that's how Salman Rushdie got in trouble, you know, the author. Many of the names of Allah are names that are more associated with Lucifer and not with 
uh, the Lord God Almighty. And so the, the great conflict right now in our world is, is Allah the true God or Jehovah Yahweh the creator God, the God who eternally exists in three persons, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Or is it this, this um, kind of what, what we would call a Unitarian God, this, this one non-Trinitarian God? And by the way, uh, the Muslims and the Mormons have a lot in common. They both are this, this Unitarian view of God rather than a Trinitarian view. So, uh, but the whole thing is shaping up so that the world will know who the Lord is. And I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes, for I will take you. So when is God saying this? He's saying this 2,600 years ago. God said through Ezekiel, remember Ezekiel, I showed you all the charts last week. He was in the second, you know, Daniel went in the first, Ezekiel went in the second, Babylonian uh, captivity. So 600 years before Christ, God said, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of uh, all countries and will bring you into your own land. What countries was Israel in, in 600 BC? Well, some apostate northerners from Samaria were in Assyria. But when did Israel get into all countries. Well, it wasn't, it, and it wasn't in the Babylonian captivity either. They didn't go into countries, they went into Babylon, which swallowed up Assyria. So they just did a lateral. They went from one land to another. When, when did Israel need to get gathered out of all countries? It wasn't until AD 70 when the Romans banned them from the land of Israel. And killed a million of them and took everyone else they could get and sold them into slavery all over the world. And the Jews were banned from the Holy Land, from the Holy City, especially Hadrian's time onward, and were sent all over the world. But look at this. I will gather you out of all countries. So 600, 2,600 years ago, 600 BC, God said, you're going to get sent to all the world. And that took place 600 years later when they were thrown out of uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Land. But he said, sometime in the future, I'm gonna gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Own land. Israel from 600 or 586 BC didn't have their own land. They were always an occupied nation. They never, I mean, they had a little rebellion in the Maccabean time, but they were still, they were still occupied nation. They just were fighting off for a while, their occupiers, but Rome finally came and crushed that rebellion. So this, what's interesting is this part of what Ezekiel said, it's only been since 1948 that Israel got their own land. You can put a date right there they didn't have a land that was their own for 2,500 plus years, almost 2,600 years. So this is a fascinating, uh, if you want something fascinating, Ezekiel 36 is God saying, I have promised I'm going to restore Israel as a nation. And he said that as they were being carried off to Babylon. Uh, secondly, God gives us a picture. Look at chapter 37. I mean, if, you, if you've read it, you know what I mean. Uh, the Lord starts talking about when he does this, when he brings, see, when he brings them back, as, as we just were reading here, when he brings them back from among the heathen, it doesn't mean they're, they're believers. It doesn't mean that they're practicing servants and worshipers of the Lord. And so chapter 37 shows them in God's sight they were like bones that were all put back. It's like a, a big graveyard, and he takes the bones and builds a body out of it, but it's still dead. It's just, it's just in the shape of a body. Spiritually, there's no life. And so the restoration of Israel, they were brought back to life in the flesh. They became a real living nation, but they don't have the Spirit of God within them. They are trusting in their armaments and their expertise and their patents and their Nobel Prizes and their great riches. But 
the, the, what the Lord is doing is, Isaiah talked about too, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. God always is looking for this remnant. And, and tonight, nobody asked me about that, but the remnant is what you see in Zechariah 12 through 14. As God saves what Paul talks about in Romans 9 through 11, God saves all of Israel. All, what is all to God? All of the remnant, all of those who put their faith in Christ, all of those who look up and mourn for the one that they pierced. And so what's interesting is this, the spiritual element is just starting to dawn. In fact, I have a very dear friend who has spent most of his uh, recent adult life traveling a hundred and some times to Russia. And as you know, Russia has uh, disgorged itself of many Jews, and, and so that more than half of the population of Israel today is from Russia. Most people don't even realize that. Half of Israel is from Russia. They have come out of Russia in, in all those waves of Aliyah, of, of getting out of Russia and going to Israel. In fact, uh, if you look at, I mean, just the facts of it are unbelievable. How many of their prime ministers are Russian? I mean, the only reason in 1948 that Russia voted at the UN for Israel, they thought it was going to be a communist place because they had these collective farms and they were living on kibbutz. They all were from Russia anyway. They were going to come back to Mother Russia, so Russia just voted for them and didn't realize that they were helping God's plan to take place. But what has happened so far is just the, the unbelieving return, and that has been fulfilled in the first half of the 19th century, 1948 in particular. So the Valley of Dry Bones has already been fulfilled in the sense of Israel going back to its, its uh, land, but the Spirit of God has not... I mean, can you, Israel, by the way, Israel's pretty powerful right now. Can you imagine when the Spirit of God is breathed into them? I mean, they're, they're uh, whatever, the third or fourth most powerful atomic power in the world. Undeclared, but they are. But can you imagine when the Spirit of God starts fighting their battles? Okay, now, let's go to chapter 38, because this is the heart of what we're going to cover for the next 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a little history lesson, because remember, my, my major work, both in undergrad and grad and postgrad, was all in history. Uh, church history and general history and history history. I love uh, history, but, but I want to show you how I see history. I don't see history uh, from our perspective. I like to go back and see how they looked at historical geography. So basically, uh, some of the, the pieces we have, if you look in chapter 38, it says, the word of the Lord came to be saying, verse 2 of Ezekiel 38, son of man, set your face against Gog, of the, land, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. Um, just, I mean, without, without any prophetic books, without Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth, which is a great book, um, without all that, what do the people that lived a long time ago say about this? Okay, Ezekiel was written... Ezekiel, here's for perspective, Ezekiel was written in the 6th century B.C. The 6th century B.C. Hesiod wrote in the 8th century B.C. He was writing 200 years before Ezekiel. This Greek teaching, didactic means teaching poet, equated the Magogians with the Scythians or Scythians. Now, that's a biblical word. In the New Testament, Paul said, for in Christ there's neither barbarian, uh, Jew, Greek, barbarian, bond, or free. And then he throws in Scythian. And that's the word that's usually used for barbarian, but it's actually the word Scythian. And in some versions of the Bible, you'll see that actual word in the New Testament. Also, when you get to Christ city, uh, that, that he ministered in called the Decapolis cities. Remember, Jesus in the Gospels is serving, preaching in what is called the Decapolis. Um, 
Decapolis, one of the cities of the Decapolis, and the only one that Jesus ministered in, because it was the only one that was on this side of the Jordan River, is called Scythopolis. It's the city of the Scythians. So this man, living 200 years before Ezekiel, if, if you said the Magogians, the people of Magog, you don't have to read, you don't have to try and read modern, you know, people say, oh, you're just pushing the Russians into it. No. The Magogians in the 8th century BC were the Scythians. Now, Herodotus, he's called the father of history, just like we have the father of medicine and everything else uh, from the, the Greek uh, world. The father of history, now a century after. Now, look where we've gotten to. This is 100 years after Ezekiel. Herodotus called the, the Scythians the ones who were associated with Magog. So for 300 years, they have remained as, as being associated. And what he does, Herodotus tells us where they came from. He said they're a 10th century BC warrior group. And then we go into other Greek philosophers and Jewish ones, uh, Josephus, a historian. He, when Josephus talked about what, what we would know as the Great Wall of China, he called that area where the wall was built the ramparts of Gog and Magog, that the, the Chinese building their Great Wall were building it to hold out and hold back these northerners that were invading them, that, and they called the Great Wall the ramparts of Gog and Magog. So another interesting little piece, and this is from the first century. Now, um, when I used to travel uh, teaching in Bible institutes in, in Russia, we always would you know, fly through Moscow, and we'd go to the Kremlin and, and uh, just see another part of it. If you go through the Kremlin, it's like the Smithsonian. It's their history of their people, of the Russian people. In the last time I was in the Kremlin in 1999, I'm sure they've changed it, but the first exhibit in the Kremlin was how they showed that their ancestors were the Scythians who came from, and these are the, the Russian words, the Srubnaya and the Adronovo uh, people that, and I'll show you a map of them, that were from the uttermost parts of the north. So but without coming to our time and pushing something back, if you just look through history, you'll find that, that there has been a consistent description of the people. Now, this is what the world looked like in the time of the Bible. This is world geography at the time of the book of Revelation was being widely circulated. In fact, this is the view we as Westerners have of uh, the world. This was the center of the world in the Bible times. Of course, Rome dominated things. Uh, right here, you, you all know that's the Holy Land right there. Uh, and you can recognize Egypt down here. So where were these where were these Scythians from? They were from this part of the world, right up here. The Scythians, and that way, going to the far north. But they were known as the people that were, these are the Caucasus Mountains. And it, it's kind of like a little divider here on this, this between the, the Caspian and the uh, Black Sea. The, the Caucasus Mountains were kind of like a divider, and the Scythians were on one side, and the Roman Empire was on the other side. Now here, this divider is Parthia. Uh, Parthia, think of the Parthians, you can think of the Iranians, you can think of the Kurds, you can think of the Medes, that, that whole area was never conquered by the, the Roman, it was fought over and, and a lot of, of give and take, but the Parthian region was always uh, uh, kind of beyond the, the scope of the full control of the Roman Empire. So this is what the world looked like from the Westerners' view. And uh, for just a minute, look in your Bible. So uh, it, this would have been the map if you'd have gone to school with the Apostle John. You know, it's a little after him, it's Trajan's time, but it's very similar. So look down at, at Ezekiel 38, and I want to show you something. Um, it says, uh, uh, verse 5, from Persia, uh, from Cush or Ethiopia, and from Libya, or if you have a version of the Bible, it could say put. 
You see that in verse five? If you see those words like Persia, uh, Ethiopia or Cush and Libya or put, say yes. You have those? Okay. Now, if you're going to school back then, uh, this is Libya, this, this region up here on the north part of Africa on, along the shore. Actually, uh, it would encompass what, what we would call Libya and Algeria and even Tunisia. Uh, it was that north shore. Um, Cush was what the region that was south of Egypt. Here's where Egypt ended. Down here was Cush. In fact, you remember Moses had a what wife? Cushite wife. She was not Egyptian. She was from south of Egypt, which is called Cush. Do you know what's down there now? Sudan. Do you know what Sudan thinks of Israel? Not very much. So, so look back at this list. In verse 5, Persia, that's this, this Parthian uh, area over here that to this day is not very happy about Israel. Uh, Libya, or Put, which is Algeria and Libya and Tunisia, again, part of the North African Muslim uh, group of people that are not real excited about Israel's existence. Cush down here, Sedan, uh, actually is manufacturing missiles for Iran. So you can tell where their loyalties are. Um, and then it starts naming off in, in up here in verse two, set your face against Gog and Magog, and the princes of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal. Uh, you know, basically it's talking about this whole region here, which would be modern day Turkey, and the people from beyond the Caucasus, which are these Scythians. Okay, so that's just how Western civilization looks at it. Now, this is interesting. This is, if, if you are Oriental, if you're Chinese, um, and you look at history, China was always building, you know, I don't have room for the Great Wall over that way, but this is why they were building it. There were these people that were such skilled riders that they could ride at a full gallop with no saddle, holding on to the horse, and they could turn around in their horse at a full gallop, and they could shoot their bow and arrow at the people behind them. They were the most feared fighters of the ancient world because, and they had these secret, nobody knew how they got them, silk vests. Now silk was not bulletproof, but when an arrow hit silk, it didn't penetrate the silk, it just went in and they were able to pull the arrow out and they didn't get infected. They only got injured. And those silk shirts were, which they, they had learned how to, uh, um, you know, in the, in the Chinese guarded the silk secret for centuries. But the Scythians were these fearsome warriors that would come down from this region up here that's called the steppes. Uh, it's just gradual higher and higher hills. And again, you can see the Caucasus Mountains here. And so they didn't come down this way because the Parthian kingdom and, and some of these, you know, the, the tribal areas that are in modern Afghanistan and all that, they would come up this way and would come into the land and come down and would bother all of the Babylonians and Assyrians. And they, they did make it, by the way. The Scythians made it to right there. That's where Scythopolis is. That's their furthest south penetration. They came from up there into the Holy Land right there. So that's how the Chinese would think about it. This is how, uh, if, if you look at the world empires, this is basically Alexander the Great. You remember Alexander's, uh, uh, he was from somewhere. His father was the king of Macedonia, but but he was from somewhere over here. I don't know where I've been to his grave, but somewhere over there in Greece. And, and he took his father's empire and just whirlwind, took it all the way to India. But again, you notice what he didn't do. He didn't go past here and he didn't go past here. Why? Because that's where these Scythians were. And they were so powerful that they just kept up there. So that's just another view of the empires. Now this is what's fascinating. This is a Russian map. I love it. Uh, this is what they had in the um, uh, Kremlin. 
and see the Srubnayas and the Androvos, and you can see the colors. And these two groups merged into, uh, this is talking about just after the time of, of Abraham, those two groups were merging together and became the Scythians. But you notice, this is Moscow, and these are the steppes of Russia. So, and, and this is Siberia. So, I mean, let me ask you, like I said last time, if I said uh, it's between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan and south of you know, Lake Superior, what would I be talking about? Well, if you say it's from the far north, it's the, the Scythian people, it's the people that live north of the Caucasus, the people that live north of the description that, that we would have of Turkey, without any prophetic writer, you can figure out who they're talking about. They're talking about these, these people from the far north that were such fearsome fighters who became today known as the Russians. But back then, they had all these other terms. So who participates in Ezekiel 38 and 39? Well, this, what the event is, and if we had time, and we don't tonight, to read the whole account, it's fascinating. God himself stops an invasion of Israel. And who's invading Israel? Magog, who all the ancient writers associate with these people that live up there beyond the Caucasus Mountains and eastern Anatolia, you know, the, they, they even broke in so far as eastern Turkey. But it's not clear when it happens. That's the only thing we're not sure. I mean, no Bible scholar disputes that it's going to happen. It's just we don't know when it's going to happen. But who is it? Well, it's I mean, look in your Bible. We'll, we'll list them off. Verse 5 has Persia, a.k.a. Iran. Um, the the uh, Cush is next, which, you know, your Bible might say Ethiopia, but that's really South Cush. If you want all Cush, you've got to have Sudan, too. Put, which is the north shore, I mean, the north part of Africa, the south shore of the Mediterranean, which is Libya, Algeria, might even be Tunisia. Uh, Gomer, which is an, and, uh, um, another term for Turkey. And then Togarma, which could easily be all of these, uh, what we call the stands, you know, the, the uh, Tajikistan and Kazakhstan and, and all the stands, which are basically... Um, Muslim today, and then Meshach and Tubal, which are the ancient Scythians and modern Russians. So who participates? Wow. Right now, every day, if you, if you follow Google, they are threatening to destroy Israel. Um, these people today are making missiles to destroy Israel. These people are giving all their armaments now that Muammar Gaddafi is gone to all, I mean, most of Libya's armaments are now in the hands of the, the, the antagonists surrounding Israel. Uh, Turkey, uh, you know, they keep, they're part of NATO, but they, they keep wish-washing on us. The, it's interesting, right now, the Central Asian Muslims are not really against Israel. In fact, they're letting them base their airplanes there right now, which is fascinating. Uh, but they'll change their mind. And, of course, Russia has warned Israel flatly to leave Syria alone. So, back to when is Ezekiel 38 and 39? I don't know. But whenever it is, it's very interesting what happens. And what happens is, if you read this, God wades in and, and stops this group from attacking Israel. And it appears if it's before the tribulation, if it is here, um, and we're right there on this chart. So if it's any time in the near future, then it, it appears from what it says that Israel suffers so greatly in this battle. Even though the Lord fights for them, they, they suffer and they have to surrender uh, some of their, it could be that they even give up their atomic weapons, which would be the, the bottom line for Israel. Um, you know, they have submarines, they have missiles, and they have airplane-delivered atomic bombs. Um, if they do that, that's when this covenant 
gets, when, when a, as we saw last time, when a ruler of the people that destroyed Jerusalem, who destroyed Jerusalem? The Romans. So when a continuation of the Roman Empire ruler makes a covenant with Israel, and what it could look like is that Europe says, we will make uh, a, a seven-year promise to you that Russia, Iran, China, you name it, if they attack you, they're attacking us. So we will guard you, Israel. But in order to make the Muslims not be so upset, if you'll give up your 250 nuclear, thermonuclear weapons, we will defend you. And uh, it appears that this Antichrist is so winsome and, and makes them feel so secure that they make a seven-year promise to let him defend them. And that's, that's what kicks off what God calls the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel. And in the middle is the abomination that causes desolation. By the way, a temple is rebuilt in here somewhere because there's a temple at the midpoint of the tribulation. And uh, that's basically the, uh, what Ezekiel 38 and 39. So whoever asks that, I don't know when it's going to take place. But boy, it could take place this week, the way things are going. I don't know if you noticed, but the Russians gave the Syrians one of the most powerful surface-to-surface -surface missiles there is. It is so hypersonic that even America can't stop it. It travels uh, so rapidly, it's an unstoppable missile that's just across the border in Syria. Okay, um, if you look at, back at Ezekiel 38.6, just one last little clue here, what we're talking about. 38.6, it says uh, that, that they are from the far north. So what, what I've shown you is, right here is the Holy Land. And so this is north, and this is north, and this is north, and this is north, and this is further north, and this is further north, and this is really far north. You understand, if, if your orientation is Israel, then, then the, all of these, this coming group is from the north. Even these, what we would call the stands that are right across here, uh, those with Russia uh, are all what would be in verse, now look at verse 15. I mean, it's just repeated over and over again. Isaiah, or Ezekiel 38, 15. Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you. And then it says the same thing at the beginning of chapter 39, verse two. I will turn you around. And by the way, this is what is fascinating. Uh, this is God's intervention. Uh, uh, chapter 39, verse one. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog, by the way, Gog is, is kind of like Pharaoh. It's not really a name, it's a title. It's this um, um, high up person like a Pharaoh. And say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Now it's interesting, there's a variant here. If you have a King James, it says the sixth part of you. And, and that textual variant is very interesting. It could mean, and this is what is fascinating, that whatever army comes uh, from the north onto, uh, from the north, let's say that an army of uh, 60,000 comes down. Let, let's say that they, they get a Iranian, um, you know, inter independent states of, uh, across here, these Muslim states and some Russian troops and some Turkish troops and all the rest of them. Let's say the 60,000 of them come. The variant in that second verse that says in the King James, the sixth part, actually what it means is that five sixths don't return. So it would be if an army of 60,000 came, only 10,000 would survive the attack on Israel. And so it, it, in the old King James, it's very interesting that it, whatever happens, whatever the Lord does is significant and it defeats them. And uh, then if you read verse three, he knocks the bow out of their hand. They fall on the mountains of Israel. And then he starts talking about what he sends, um, the, the, the pestilence and everything that comes upon them. And then what's fascinating is 
uh, if you look in verse 9, and this is just what's very interesting um, in our terms. Uh, Those who dwell in the cities of Israel go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the javelins and the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. And they will not take wood from the field nor cut down any from the forest because they will make fires with the weapons that they will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who pillage them, says the Lord. That is really interesting. What, what, what weaponry could come from the north that would burn for seven years? And it's interesting to think about. I mean, even Hal Lindsey brought that up, that the half-life of radioactive material is seven years, and it's very possible they just pull all the warheads out because the Lord actually sends pestilence and kills all of these soldiers. One last thing that's just fascinating, too. Look at verse 11. It will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place in Israel and the valley and those who pass by east of the sea will obstruct travelers because they will bury Gog and his multitude and they will call it the valley of Haman Gog and for seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. And then it talks about there's going to be these people that are going to go out and set up markers. Look at verse 14. And they will set apart men regularly employed with help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. And they will set a marker by it and haul it off to that spot. And if we get back to a little enlarged map of Israel here, what it's talking about is, it says east of the sea. This is the the Dead Sea right here. You can't see it. It's really small. But they want them buried east of the Dead Sea because the people of Israel live here. What would you call that? You call that isolation. You would say that the bodies are contaminated. This is exactly, if there was any kind of weapons of mass destruction event, the cleanup of it from the mountains of Israel would be taken over into that desert area. They wouldn't want it near the populace. And so it's just, I mean... You know, if, if it happens into the future, you know, maybe we'll get away from atomic weaponry. But if it happens anytime now, and all of these armies come down converging from Russia with their tactical nuclear weapons, and God stops them here, Israel cleans them up, takes the contaminated bodies and that the Lord kills with plagues, buries them east downwind of the Dead Sea, and takes the radioactive fuel and powers Israel. That's just one scenario. The other scenario is, it's very interesting that uh, uh, in the last few weeks, Israel has been found, if we export to them our fracking technology that's, you know, controversial in America, Israel will have 250 billion barrels of oil if they can frack. Saudi Arabia has 260 billion. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that's not prophetic. That's from Bloomberg. Uh, Israel is amazing. So, okay, interesting times ahead. Uh, let me get to the last slide, and it's time to go. You guys have been sitting way too long. And um, uh, basically this. this the, the scene of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not Armageddon. Armageddon is described in the Bible as the Antichrist coming, the kings of the south coming, the kings of the east coming, the kings of the north coming. That is completely different than this event right here, this Magog invasion, which is only from the north. So the, the events don't confuse Ezekiel 38 and 39 with the final battle in the hill of Megiddo. So there we go. Uh, my goal was before we were snowed in that we'd finish and that's it. So um, next time we're gonna actually have questions from the floor. I'm sure I've said more than enough here to confuse everybody. And so we'll have our microphones out next time and you can say, wait a minute, what does this mean? And um, we will try and put the pieces together. But let's all stand and get the blood flowing and uh, let's thank the Lord uh, tonight that there are no accidents with God. Everything is being orchestrated by our God of the universe and and it's all in his mind centering around Israel. He's going to get Israel isolated. He's going to get them so that everybody in the world is against them and, and even are going to be attacked by one of the greatest groups that could possibly oppose them. And in that moment, he's going to save them so that all the world will know who's the real God. And even after he does that, the world doesn't want him. And so don't be discouraged, just be faithful sharing the gospel. But let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you're watching over it to perform it. 
Thank you that you want us to know the future because so much of your word is prophetic. And thank you that you have told us what you're going to do in the future, not to scare us and not to get us paranoid and, and stocking up, but for us to live sensibly, wisely, prudently, but redemptively. I pray that we would want to share the good news, knowing that most people will reject it, but asking your spirit to go before us, prepare their hearts, and may we have the joy of seeing the miracle of salvation in the lives of people that we share your good news with. Thank you for letting us gather. We commit our lives to you who are the God of history, and we trust you to watch over us as you unfold your plan. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.